The readers of Jane and P appropriately selected stroke with the introduction of thrombolysis and endovascular recanalization therapy as the second greatest contribution in the last century. I wanted to put the advances in endovascular therapy in context and start just with what has changed in the last 25 years with regard to stroke prevention. Something so basic as blood pressure regulation has undergone a complete change in perception. Uh, when I was in training, uh, we, we uh, had a target of systolic blood pressures of less than 140 uh, with the idea that maintaining patients within that range would help prevent stroke and other cardiovascular comorbidity. Subsequently, we've learned that blood pressures over 130 millimeters mercury systolic increase the risk of stroke significantly. And for decades, we've been setting our goals uh, much too high for blood pressure, uh, therefore uh, exposing our patients both to risk of ischemic stroke, intracerebral hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and cognitive decline in the elderly. Another major change is with regard to atrial fibrillation. When I started practicing neurology, we had one drug to prevent cardioembolism related to atrial fibrillation. That was warfarin. Warfarin is a very difficult drug to manage in the real world. There are many interactions with dietary and pharmacological therapies. Patients have to go for serial blood testing as, as frequently as weekly. Um, and therefore, noncompliance was a major concern. Roughly 40% of the time, patients on warfarin were subtherapeutic or supratherapeutic, exposing them to risk of cardioembolism or intracerebral hemorrhage. In the last 25 years, this has changed dramatically. We now have four um, non-vitamin K dependent anticoagulants, uh, dabigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and adoxaban. These have been demonstrated to be at least uh, non-inferior to warfarin, in some cases superior to warfarin, and which am, with a much greater safety profile with reduced risks of major bleeding and intracranial bleeding. More recently, uh, people have been exploring uh, devices to help prevent cardioembolism and atrial fibrillation. The conundrum is that patients with cerebrovascular disease often have risk factors for both intracerebral hemorrhage as well as ischemic stroke. Many patients who have cardioembolic stroke have already suffered intracerebral hemorrhage, either asymptomatically or symptomatically. So how do you manage these patients? Well, one approach is to occlude the left atrial appendage. The left atrial appendage sets up um, an, an area of aberrant flow in patients with atrial fibrillation. Stasis in this region causes thrombosis and small particles embolize to cause cardioembolic stroke. Therefore, being able to occlude the appendage helps prevent the formation and embolization of thrombus and allows patients to live stroke-free without the risks of anticoagulation. We've also seen, seen a dramatic change in our approach to antiplatelet therapy. It used to be that aspirin alone was used for non-cardioembolic stroke. Many would pontificate as to whether the proper dose of aspirin was 50 milligrams, 70 milligrams, 81 milligrams, 325 milligrams, all the way up to 1300 milligrams. We've stopped debating the dose of aspirin, thankfully, and we now have other agents such as clopidogrel, ticagrelor, celostazole, and better evidence that supports the use of dual antiplatelet regimens, particularly in patients with TIA and minor stroke. Statins were barely used 25 years ago, but studies such as this, and this is just representative data from the SPARKLE trial, showed that patients treated with atorvastatin, only one of several statins uh, within this class of, of medication, could help reduce not only the risk of ischemic stroke, but also reduce the risk of other cardiovascular um, outcomes that uh, plague this patient population. So all in all, how have these changes affected global stroke incidents? Not as much as we'd like, but there are there is at least some early evidence that the, the incidence of intracerebral hemorrhage has decreased. Um, this is likely uh, due to changes in uh, blood pressure control, um, 
but we've seen little change with regard to ischemic stroke. These data are only relevant through 2017, and so it's, it is to be hoped uh, that in the last four years, uh, greater, con greater control of blood pressure, uh, greater implementation of new recommendations for antithrombotic therapy, and the routine use of statins for ischemic stroke will have further impact on these statistics. Of course, we've all been dramatically uh, astounded by the changes in acute stroke management. For one, there's just the basic perception that time is brain. This didn't exist when I was in training. A patient who came into the emergency department with an ischemic stroke was treated uh, and triaged uh, in a very non-acute fashion. We now have evidence that for every minute that is delayed, patients are losing neurons and therefore losing function and less likely to have a good outcome. The first therapy that was linked to this acute concept of managing stroke was intravenous alteplase. This has been used now for over 20 years. It's conventionally called the clot buster and educational campaigns targeted at the community have tried to educate individuals of stroke symptoms and signs that would indicate an impending stroke and require immediate uh, transfer to a hospital and the use of uh, emergency 911 to use ambulances in order to come for acute care. Believe it or not, this was not the standard back in the 1980s and 90s. Unfortunately, only 5% or less of all ischemic strokes are eligible and receive intravenous alteplase. And not all patients can benefit from this therapy. As a result, newer thrombolytic agents have been developed. Tenecteplase is becoming more widely used globally. The advantage of tenecteplase is that it just requires an immediate injection and not the subsequent hour-long infusion that sometimes delays transfer between primary and more comprehensive sophisticated stroke centers. But of course, the fact that not all patients benefit from this intravenous approach had frustrated vascular neurologists, neurosurgeons, and interventional radiologists for quite some time. In particular, it was the larger occlusion of the distal internal carotid artery and proximal middle cerebral artery that did not seem to respond to this therapy. The advent of stroke retrievers, stent retrievers rather, that uh, use an arterial access and go into the occluded vessel to actually remove the thrombus was a major game changer in 2015. Very rapidly, five trials demonstrated a benefit to endovascular treatment uh, over the conventional approach to treating patients with large vessel occlusion and the anterior circulation. As this slide demonstrates, each of these trials demonstrated a statistically significant improvement in patients living independently at 90 days if they were able to receive uh, an, a, a, an endovascular treatment that restored blood flow. The number needed to treat was like nothing we'd ever seen before in stroke. Anywhere from three to seven patients needed to be treated in order to have one more patient independent at 90 days. And if you compare that to the use of stenting in, in an acute myocardial infarction, the comparison is quite dramatic. 17 patients needed to be treated in order for one patient to benefit. This obviously transformed the field of acute ischemic stroke. The next, uh, the next uh, frontier in this regard is to couple acute revascularization with some type of neuroprotection. Uh, and as this review that was recently published in JNNP demonstrates, there are now multiple trials that are trying to assess whether combining revascularization with neuroprotection will even further improve outcomes for this devastating condition. As Nick already alluded to, one of the areas that has really not moved forward dramatically thus far is neurorecovery. Having said that, uh, there are multiple approaches that are currently being investigated. Stem cells, forms of neuromodulation, and brain-computer interfaces. And as we move forward, 
with the science of stroke and helping to improve long-term outcomes and quality of life for patients with cerebrovascular disease. I hope that all of these will eventually come into play.